we create essentially custom fairing panels for prosthetic limbs. And that takes a little explaining. It's the best way to think of it is like a metaphor, where it's like a motorcycle has the engine and the frame and all the uh, componentry to it. And then it has the fairings which surround it and really give it the form and the, the beauty and the grace and all the lines that you really associate with a sport bike. If you look at the state of the current prosthetic limb, it's a pretty clumsy, ugly thing that has been cobbled together by a bunch of biomedical engineers, never by industrial designers. And so as a result, you have this thing that's a very intimate, very personal device for somebody, yet it's really been clumsily handled, and it just begs for some quality design. And um, so it, it just was a natural fit for an industrial designer. Um, there are a lot more single amputees than double, and so that's what we do with our process. We scan the sound side leg, uh, which is the name for the surviving leg, then we mirror it over and then use that as reference geometry to create everything that follows. So we give the person their body symmetry back, and that guarantees that we're creating a unique personal product for them. We, we do get a number of bilateral amputees, people who've lost both lower limbs, and it's interesting because there we don't have the geometry to scan to start the process, to mirror over, to give them their shape back. So there we actually have to cheat a little bit and get a surrogate. So we found a couple times we found surrogates who are the same overall body morphology of the person that we're going to be working with. And they sign a legal morphology release document as you'd expect and then we scan them and use their legs over. So it's kind of like an organ donor but you know, pretty easy and harmless to be scanned. And we found that people are actually really excited to have the opportunity to share their body geometry with somebody else. We, we had one woman, she, she uh, took a boot camp class so that she could really get her calves in shape just prior to the scan so that she could really give somebody a, her calves in their best form, which is, I, I just thought that was really cool that somebody's willing to do that. We're experimenting. This is all kind of new to us as well. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work with additive fabrication, and so it has its standard uh, set of materials, but then we're experimenting with some homebrew materials as well that we're working with the major companies to, to develop that will meet our needs. Um, and then we can use anything as a substrate to then skin. So we've put wood veneer on some, leather, um, we've all kinds of all kinds of different materials, uh, carbon fiber, nylon. Anything that you would put in a car's interior or in fashion is fair game because that's more the way we think of it than as a medical product. I'm trying to use a lot of simulated suede and simulated leathers and that works out really well. They tend to, the new microfiber stuff is fantastic. It's so durable and it's cleanable and, and it's green and every other good thing. So it really works well for what we're doing. The big inspiration for the company is a book called The Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson. And it's this idea that you can rethink mass production under some circumstances when it just doesn't cut it. And when you do that, you can start thinking about a one product per person. You design and create the product for that one person. And it's a very different way to look at it, and there aren't really rules for it. So it's a kind of tricky one for an old school industrial designer to look at because there aren't parameters that really define it. There isn't a paradigm that we can work with. We didn't actually come to this with the intent of pushing the bounds of, of additive fabrication. That is more a byproduct that the idea was to solve the problem and mass production just doesn't do it. There's no way you can address this with any kind of mass production means. So I started looking into additive fabrication and doing some, a lot of experiments and finally found that yeah, it's, it's finally fully baked. The technology is ready to be used in this kind of context. It's the, the parts are certainly survivable. If you do some extra treatment to them, they are at their museum level. They're, they're gorgeous. You can, you can do really stunning pieces um, once you know the tricks and how to, how to get all the details to work right. We can leather wrap things, and the leather's fantastic. Um, everything about the additive manufacturing process is, is pretty exciting. It's, coming, it's gone through a lot of changes recently, so it's, uh, it's ready for this kind of thing. The user response is effusive. People, um, it, it changes the lives of the users. Um, we've seen people really um, kind of break down just because they realize that their life is very different when they, when they first put it on, try it on. The first guy we had, he re reached down and he felt his calf muscle, well, the, the calf that we gave him, and he kind of thought about it. And he said, I, I haven't felt that shape in eight years. That he kind of said, yeah, for eight years I've been feeling a titanium pipe and a M5 hex nut and some titanium flanges. 
he never thought he'd feel his own shape again. Uh, we had another woman who showed up um, for a follow-up meeting, and she was wearing skirts. And she was saying, yeah, she went out and bought a bunch of skirts. She hasn't worn a skirt in six years. Uh, things like that. That it's, it's, just, it's interesting coming from in, industrial design, where a lot of it really doesn't impact somebody's life to that degree, to realizing where everything we do really turns somebody's life completely around. And that, that is a pretty powerful thing to take into work every day. I have never been involved in the medical world. My background is always pure industrial design. I worked at Apple and did a lot of consulting for Apple and Nike and um, everyone else in the Bay Area. I always had this love for ID. The, the stuff that I didn't love was mass production because there's something I always found very unsatisfying. You design this part and you create it. And it's exciting to see that first prototype and then it's exciting to see some of the appearance models and the first thing roll off the line. But then it's just mass-produced junk that's just destined for the landfill. So I always kind of felt a little empty after the product was out of my hands. It's, it's much more satisfying, I think, right now that we can actually create one thing on a per-person basis. It also kind of appeals to a real short attention span, which I always had as a kid, where once I'm done with a project, I'm kind of done with it. And it's now our turnaround time is about two, three days per person. person comes in, we talk to them, we scan them, we design the new thing, and then we send it out start with another person. So each one is this completely self-contained design project. And it's pretty exciting, really short attention span stuff. Th this is entirely different work that we're doing with Bespoke from traditional consulting in the sense that there, there's a meaning to it that is really profound, that you're working directly with the end user. They, they have a face and a name and a story. You hear the story, you, you hear about how they lost their leg and their whole life story that, that goes into that get to know their emotions and where they, they're at, and then you get to fold that into the design that you're creating for them. That, to me, is a really powerful way to do a design. Um, it's, it's not as impersonal, I find, as when you're creating something that's intended to be made by the millions and millions and identical stuff.